Hello, I'm Shannon Harris. Thanks for tuning in to Window in Wilmington. And I just want to say Happy New Year to everybody. Happy and New Year. this is a new year and we are on our new set. We're still in the construction phases, but as you can see, it looks great. And uh, stay tuned. There'll be a lot more changes made to it and it'll look great. But I'm so glad that you ladies could be here. I'm so glad to be here as well. Yeah. Thanks right. for having me. So let's tell us. So on today's show, we'll talk about um, youth volunteer opportunities um, and also have opportun volunteer opportunities for MLK Day. We'll also find out what the next generation of Delaware Community Foundation is. Do the Right Thing for Life Banquet is coming up, and we'll have details on that, and we'll find out what Kim Folk has been doing and how you can help out. But first, Narcan is an emergency medication developed more than 50 years ago to help reverse the effects of an opioid dose, overdose, opioid dose, opioid overdose. My goodness, try saying that three times real <laughs> fast, but I'm sure you ladies say it all the time. Now available in either a syringe form or a nasal applicator, Narcan has been made more available to members of the public emergency and responders thanks to the support from the federal government and many states. Dr. Car Carol Ortay and Dominica Persanti join me now to tell us all about it and how it will be used in Delaware. Opioid, opioid overdose. Can we say that three times real fast? No. Oh, maybe we could, but uh, I don't want to say it again. We wish we didn't have to say yeah, it at all ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad both of you ladies could be here today. And Dr. Rattay, I want you to tell us about the prescription drug epidemic in Delaware first, because that seems to be a problem here. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was several years ago, really in 2009, that we first realized that we were seeing more deaths in Delaware from um, uh, drug overdoses than we were motor vehicle accidents. And so we had seen just a significant increase in drug overdose deaths. Um, it was really shocking to see, and it was very clear to us that we were dealing with an epidemic. I must live in a bubble. I would have never imagined something like that. Yeah, we, uh, it's been seen all across the nation. Um, Delaware has um, some especially bad numbers um, around we do prescribe or we have been over the past decade or so prescribing a high amount of, of opiates, um, high doses. Um, we, we actually pr are one of the highest prescribing states in, in the nation. Now we've done a lot of work to turn that around. Unfortunately, that has pushed a lot of individuals who have become addicted um, into using heroin. Wow. So I guess that, needless to say, then drives up the heroin usage rate. Yes, absolutely. As we have um, done a number of things to decrease access to prescription drugs, heroin has become more readily available for individuals. Now, let's talk about what Narcan is. Um, what is it and how does this work? So it's a drug that um, completely counters opiates, opiates which would be you know, uh, many of the painkillers that are prescribed, as well as heroin are opiates. And so if somebody overdoses on any kind of opiate, um, the Narcan or Naloxone will reverse the effect of, of uh, um, the respiratory suppression that where people stop breathing and eventually their their heart stops so again uh, Narcan can reverse those effects if it's not too late into the overdose right well you know what we have a PSA a Narcan PSA so why don't we take a look at that and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about the programs and everything that's going to be happening in the state in the city of Wilmington sounds terrific okay all across the country, the number of suspected overdose deaths attributed to heroin or prescription painkillers is on the rise. Delaware state law now allows for family members, friends, or individuals with an addiction to be trained in a single one-hour class on how to use the nasal spray commonly known as Narcan an emergency medication that can help reverse the effects of an overdose. The free classes will be on a first-come, first-served basis, and registration is not required. The Narcan nasal spray kit costs $50, but there are also provisions for those who cannot afford it. For more information, call Brandywine Counseling at 302-504-5920. You can also visit www.helpisheredee.com.
Okay, so that was a PSA on the use of Narcan, and you know, as we saw that there was someone, you know, doing it with this uh, syringe uh, with the nasal applicator, and you know, the syringe applicator. I guess you know, I'm new to this. I don't know, you know. So you t walk me through this. <laughs> we actually have a demo. Oh, really? If, uh, if that works, it does work. Yeah. So. What, what happens? You want to stick that up my nose, do you? I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to really try it out, we could we could do that. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do this it. Is, there's no there's no medication in this. So okay. Just to show the ease of use, what happens is when obviously if we were to come across someone that was unresponsive, we would call 911. If we right. thought someone was an overdose, we would call 911, and, and that we review all of that in the training. But that's the first thing that we would ask people to do. And then this is very simplistic. So you would have your medication. You have the nasal applicator, and then you have the device that everything goes together to make the medication work. So you would just pop the top off, pop the bottom off. You would pop this top off. And then the medication goes in like this. The applicator twists on the top very simply, and then this would be loaded with medication and then simply put half up one nostril and then you would move it to the other side and push the rest of the medication up and then that's that's so the you one need dose. to do you need to do it in each nostril huh half the medication in each yes oh that's interesting and then you would wait for a response and hopefully you would see the person come to and start to breathe on their own and what are the side effects of narcan it's actually pretty well. Um, it's it's a pretty safe um, medication. Um, one of the uh, key side effects that um, is concerning to to some is that a person who comes out of an overdose um, can become very combative, mm. aggressive, and so people need to be a aware of that. But I'm sure that anybody who is getting, you know, uh, whether it's the syringe mm. or the nasal spray they're gonna be taken to some sort of a hospital or something right afterwards. Right, as Dominica was saying, I mean, the first thing that you always do is call 911. Mm -hmm. But um, um, yes, so after the, uh, after the medication is administered, um, the person eventually would, uh, would be finding higher healthcare services. Because they would also run the risk of a rebound overdose. And really? so the medication is active in their system and in the event that you don't call 911 or that they don't receive medical attention, let's say someone happened to administer the medication and then leave and you know, oh, so-and-so looks great, they're good, it's right. been a half hour, and they leave that person, what happens is when the medication wears off, those opiates are then active again in their system uh -huh. and that person can then rebound overdose, which could lead to fatality, brain wow. damage, paralysis. I mean, there's you know, multiple effects from the overdose that you wanna make sure don't happen or reduce that risk as much as possible. So that's why we encourage people to call 911 regardless of the circumstance. And hopefully that's what people do. What would happen if someone received the dosage that was not actually suffering from an overdose? So what would happen if they got a dose of Narcan and, and they weren't overdosing? Yeah, I mean, that's the good thing about this medication. It's really, um, it's really pretty benign medication, so it's really unlikely to have any negative effect on somebody who's not um, having an opiate overdose. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we always suggest erring on the side of using it if you think somebody could possibly be overdosing. If it doesn't work, then you know you may very well be dealing with something else. Right now, there are trainings for this, and there will be taking place all throughout the state. Now we have some trainings that are specifically in the Wilmington area, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, and there we're doing multiple trainings now through July, and what happens is they're open to anyone. They don't have to have a medical background or anything specific. Anyone can come to the training. They run about 50 minutes to an hour, and then we have time for questions afterwards. Uh, community members learn how to they, they learn how to do multiple things in the training we cover rescue breathing we cover recovery position we cover induction of the medication and then they're able to purchase the medication as well we go through signs and symptoms of an overdose we talk about how to respond um, lengths of time very specific and in detail and then they're able to purchase the medication at the end so they actually leave with the prescription 
if they're able to purchase it, if they have a financial hardship, we ask that they let us know that and then we'll work with them to ensure that someone who needs this medication gets it. Okay. And before we go really quick, Dr. Bate, what do you want people to know about um, the prescription epidemic and also the heroin epidemic, not only in Wilmington, but the state? Yeah, we want people to know, all individuals to know, first of all, this is affecting all demographics, people of all income levels, all races and ages, and um, it c clearly is an epidemic. We really hope people will go to our website, www.helpusherede.com. There's a lot that you can get from this website, how families and community members can help educate people to prevent it where they can find treatment services, where they can find information about the trainings, and also we're really trying hard to um, help destigmatize addiction so that people realize it's a chronic disease like many others, and treatment is, can be effective, and recovery works for many, many people. Thank you ladies both so much for coming on. And please come back and let us know how the programs are working out and if there's any more information you'd like to share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Next up, Volunteer Delaware after these messages. for calling the GED Pep Talk Center. Jerry Stiller speaking. Your level seven in your face pep talk. I can keep pushing. Believe me, I'm good at it. Once you've got your GED diploma, you'll feel so good about yourself. You've come. Mr. Trejo, can I transfer this guy to you? He needs something a little more... Persuasive? Yes! Whatever motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Get your GED pep talk and find free classes at yourged.org. Today, school kids rely on the internet for so many things. Homework, math, research. But what about kids who don't have internet at home? Hello, I'm Theo Gregory, Wilmington City Council President. The internet is essential. As many as 80% of low-income families do not have access at home, including many right here in Wilmington. So help bridge this gap by supporting local broadband adoption programs. Let's get more students and families connected to the power of the internet. Volunteer Delaware strives to promote volunteer opportunities, community outreach programs, and other resources in order to enhance the health and well-being of all Delawareans. Carrie Hart, the great bearer of good volunteer opportunities. Yeah. Yay! Love it. That's right. my see, new title. See, that's right. That's your <laughs> new title. Right. Is here to tell us about, um, let me see, this year's Governor's Awards. So it's Outstanding Volunteer Awards, right, and the Youth Awards, mm -hmm. and uh, opportunities for a volunteer for MLK Day, right? Yes. Hey, Carrie. Yeah, Happy New Thank Year. Thank you for having me. Again. I'm glad you came. <laughs> so MLK Day, Monday, everybody's wondering what to do. Yes. So um, we just posted on our website and Facebook page, I think about 20 different opportunities throughout the state that people can look on there, see what works for them, and register for. And it's everything from working with Habitat for Humanity to state parks, so it's a little too cold for me outside right yeah. now, but some people <laughs> like it. Um, so lots of meaningful ways to make a difference on MLK Day, so it's really Good. exciting. Good, and they should just go to your website and look at the, op the volunteer opportunities and then contact your office? Uh, they don't even have to contact our office. Really? They can click on the MLK Day um, link right on our homepage, and there's even a photo they can click on and see all of them and contact the organizations directly. Um, and it's on our Facebook page too. So it's really quick, very easy to do, five minutes or less. Okay, great. Yeah. Right, so we want everybody to make sure to check out your Facebook page and your website. Yes. All right, so let's get into the Governor's Outstanding Volunteer Awards. Yeah, um, yeah. the Youth Awards nominations are coming up, or they're actually going on right now. And so while you're on our website or Facebook page getting your MLK opportunities, you can click right below that for the Youth Awards and nominate someone, a youth, an organization, a school group, whatever have you. Um, for these awards and what are they looking for Carrie so when you nominate someone so I shouldn't just nominate like my neighbor for 
mowing his lawn or something, right? Like, what are the things that make a great, oh, well, I don't know, Paul, he might <laughs> mow everybody's lawn, he might, yeah, whatever. You know, but there's like a criteria, right? I we mean, did have laughing. a lawn service win, um, no. guy win for a Lifetime Achievement Award a few years ago. Wow. because. <laughs> <laughs> he and his um, volunteer, he, he and his business um, cleaned up cemeteries and other public areas okay, that were but in that's disrepair. A good one. So right. you never know. Right. You can't right. nominate right. those right. Uh, See, lawn people okay. or someone doing a snow Listen, removal lawn care stuff. people, I think you do a great <laughs> job. I wasn't saying anything bad. I was just saying, right? <laughs> but that's a good question. On the nomination form, there is an eligibility um, section. There's about five things. So. They have to do at least 50 hours a year, um, be under 18 for because these are the youth awards. Mm -hmm. A couple things like that, very easy um, to, to work with. And actually, Dr. Rattay's group, um, Attack Addiction, who um, was with Narcon, helping to promote that and get that bill passed, won our governor's award, one of our governor's wow. awards in October. So it really does That's cover great. the spectrum from people volunteering in the healthcare fields to environment to, you know, just in their neighborhood. You never know. Um, who's out there and who should be volunteering and win this award. What kind of volunteers have you seen, um, th the winners from like past years, what typically were they doing? Oh my gosh, especially for youth, it's really humbling to see all the things that these youth do. Um, a lot of them create their own opportunities. There was one girl who, um, with her church, she saw that um, other countries, third world countries needed water, so she started collecting shoes and sent mm. them to an organization that turned every 2,000 pairs of shoes, I think it was, into a well in Africa. And she collected something like 20,000 pairs of shoes. I'd like to I see mean, the shoe well. I know, right? That I think is that's interesting, a shoe well? Yeah, and actually my gym has it now. You can donate your old gym shoes to go towards water in Africa. So, you know, it's things like that, you know, creating a Relay for Life team, or um, one girl was living with cancer, and so she um, worked with other kids in, AI DuPont and in Philadelphia hospitals to make them feel better about what they were right. going through since she had gone through it herself. So the youth in particular really go out there and create their own opportunities and it's inspiring to see what they're doing. Can you nom can a person nominate like a group like let's say if it's like Boy Scouts or mm -hmm. things like that can you nominate like groups of kids at one time? Absolutely. Um, good question again. Um, the Boy mm -hmm. Scout pack, oh, I forget their number, one I think two years ago and they were the cutest little kids ever. It was a little cub pack. And so they were eight or nine years old in their outfits, and it was so cute. So you can nominate Cub Aww. Scouts. You can nominate. Um, we had an actual whole entire school win one year because really? um, it was a school, <laughs> excuse me, in mm -hmm. Sussex County, and part of their curriculum is volunteering. Um, I think it's 20 hours a month for each student, and so the kids vote on what they want to do each month That's and go cool. out there and impact the community as a group. So. You, you know, from schools to those Boy Scouts to individual groups, you, you never know who's out there making a difference and you deserve this award. So keep your eyes out and nominate. Yeah. Have you seen a rise in people in the state of Delaware and, and across the country volunteering? Yes. And particularly in Delaware, because the governor and first lady are so passionate about this, um, we were the state with the largest rise in volunteerism about two years ago. And I think this go. year, we're, if we're not number one this year, we're, again, pretty close because it's amazing what a little word of mouth and education about volunteerism can do. Some people think, oh, I'm just cleaning up my neighbor's right, trash or, right. or you know, <laughs> snow removal is just what I do in the neighborhood or, you know, what have you. But those things are all volunteerism, Get, getting in your, involved in your kid's school and making cookies and being on the PTA. That's all volunteerism. And so as people get educated about that, they think, oh, you know, I'm making a difference. They're feeling better. And it's just a snowball effect in the community in a really positive way. And you did mention the governor and First Lady Markell. And I know First Lady Markell um, has been very passionate mm -hmm. since um, the governor took office on volunteer opportunities and getting people encouraged to, you know, go ahead and volunteer. Absolutely. She's a volunteer herself. She mentors at least one other student. I think she might do two or three, actually, um, mentoring them because that's her passion. And so she, she really knows what she's talking about when she asks people to go out and volunteer because she does it herself, which I think is really a big, powerful statement. Um, she's not just talking the talk. She's walking the walk. And so to encourage people to get out there. And again, we're all about getting people to volunteer in something that's meaningful and fun for them. So. If volunteering to, you know, 
snow removal or you know being outside in winter is not your thing we have something for you um an example is my aunt loves chocolate of course Yay. who doesn't um and when I'll i found out for that. yeah well the wilmington public library has a chocolate festival when and, and it's coming up i believe so oh. when they posted yeah. that on our website a few years ago i immediately called my aunt and said i have an opportunity for you and so she's been volunteering there ever since so you know you never quite know where one volunteer, volunteer opportunity can take you or your or your love of chocolate <laughs> and at both, and I'm going to do that one. And I want to say to you before we, I ask you about the week of um, service in April, that I want to mention that one great volunteer opportunity that I found out through your office was um, Bake the Night Away. Yes. And yes. that was a great volunteer opportunity, mm -hmm. and Chef was great. And, you know, I think that is really a good initiative that that school does to, you know, bring some happiness to first responders. And the police, and I have to say from, again, experience with that, you know, delivering those cookies to the police officers you know, in December when it's probably really tough on them, um, it made their day, particularly the, you know, the small little police stations that you may not think about in Marydell or Hartley or you know, these small towns to get those cookies from these kids that mean so much with little notes written oh, on them. Oh, and they were good. The, world. Oh. the cookies were, let me tell you, I probably ate the whole box. I don't know, they might have helped me out, but I no, I didn't. You ate some too. <laughs> he had half. Real quick, Carrie. Um, okay, week of service. I know we got a Paul. Uh, I know we got a Paul. I know we got to go, Paul. Week of service in April. <laughs> Sorry, having too much fun. Yes. <laughs> Which, what do you, should everybody know about that? And um, do they need to sign up for that uh, ahead of time? April 12th through 18th, we'll have more information on our website. Okay. Um, and just get out there and volunteer that week. It's all about, again, that um, getting people knowledgeable about volunteering and getting out there and doing something that they love. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you, love Sharon. seeing you. <laughs> and make sure you keep me now in the loop on the chocolate volunteer thing. Mm -hmm. Any more cookie things. That's right, guys. You ate those cookies. They ate those cookies. Don't lie. Don't, don't I listen. didn't get any cookies. So I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're too far away. <laughs> Uh, next time. Next time. But we'll see you again. Yeah. All right. Up next, the next generation of Delaware Community Foundation, Northern Delaware, when we return. <laughs> We are your Wilmington City Council, and we're also your neighbors. We're asking you to let us know about your community events, achievements, concerns, and issues. That's why we created a special email address that will connect you to all of us in City Council. Drop us an email about things going on in your neighborhood with Community Events 22 at WilmingtonDE.gov. That's Community Events 22 at WilmingtonDE.gov. You wanted to be a teacher when you were little, but things changed. Teaching didn't seem that cool anymore. So you decided to become something else. But what would your 12-year-old self say? Amazing things are happening in teaching, so it's time to put it back on your list. Don't try to convince yourself otherwise. You had it right the first time. The Next Generation or Next Gen is a philanthropic organization whose mission is to develop young professionals into effective nonprofit board leaders. Danielle Dick and David Arthur join me now to talk to us about it and this great opportunity to develop young people into nonprofit leaders. Thanks for having us in your wonderful new set. Here. You like it? Oh, I am so nervous. Like yeah, yes. look, right? I know. <laughs> look, uh, it's got me all thrown off. My mojo isn't here, so I'm like all over the place today. I don't it's know. It's because you're too comfortable. Maybe, yeah. yeah. And it smells new, like a new car, right? It does. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Take it in. Really, it does smell like a new car. Okay. 
<laughs> so, David, I have had a chance to work with you on other things, and I, you know, just did not know that this organization that you're with now does this, and was kind of surprised, and didn't know that there's like a whole process into developing a young person into like an effective nonprofit leader. Yeah, which is great. Know, it was a hidden world to me too, and I think for most of us that are involved, you know, our group is typically people, you know, in the ages of 25 to 40, young professionals living and working in Delaware, people that want to give back, and maybe these people had been told, that, you know. Sure, you can hand out water at our 5K or you can sell raffle tickets at our fundraiser, which is great, but they want to do more. And they'd also heard about you know, serving on boards and nonprofit boards and didn't know how they go about doing that or what they would do once they were there. So, so that's really why, why we're here. And um, we learn by doing. We were mentored by the Delaware Community Foundation. And uh, we, we run our own meetings. We raise our money. We give it away. And we really try to um, develop the next round of philanthropic leaders in Delaware. Really? So what happens? They come to you and they say, okay, David, I have this idea and I think I want to be, you know, a nonprofit or something like that. And you say, okay, well, do you help them? What do you do? Do you help map it out or? We, yeah, we more look at the, the individual. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great boards out there and, and you'll hear some boards that um, wish they were a little more effective. So our, our goal is to really teach people before they get onto a lot of these boards and um, so that they can, they can kind of bring that effectiveness right. um, to that board. So a lot of our people find out by accident. It could be um, you know a networking event or uh, I had a random meeting during a job I previously had with the Blue Rocks that said, come to a meeting. So we always have new faces at our meetings and people go and they take it in, then they volunteer and then they're, they're in. And then um, you know from there people are usually involved two to five years and then ultimately they'll graduate and they'll go serve on other nonprofit boards and kind of take what they've learned to those organizations. Now, how did you meet Danielle? Through NextGen. Through NextGen, <laughs> yes. So when I was new to Delaware, had just moved here, a friend of mine had suggested I join and had forwarded all of the meeting information. Um, I showed up, I sat in on a couple meetings. It definitely seemed interesting. And what I loved about it so much was that I was really able to learn and get hands-on experience in things that in my professional setting, in my job, I don't have the opportunity right. to do. Um, so what's really great about it is I went to Dave as president and said, you know, I'm very interested in development. It's not something I'm very familiar with, but I'd really like to learn more. Um, so what he did was connect me with another member who has worked in development for years, who uh, really sort of showed me the ropes um, and with hands-on experience in doing a lot of development work for NextGen, I'm able to learn as we go. That's great. And I have both the folks at the DCF as well as folks within NextGen themselves that have been helping me learn the ropes and learn more and develop into somebody who's really starting to learn some things about development. So it's been great. And that's great. And I think that, you know, Dave, I want to ask you, do you hear, Danielle said, you know what, I want to learn about development, I, you know, so people come to you with specifics yes. in areas that they need improvement on or just really need a whole, like, okay, I need to know. Yes, and, and like, like uh, Danielle said, a lot of times it's something completely different than what they do. Right. We've got bankers, lawyers, people that work for nonprofits. Um, in one case, we have somebody that works in education that wanted to learn more about the finances, and they stepped up to serve as our treasurer, really not knowing a whole lot, but it's the great opportunity to learn especially with the relationship with the DCF and with some of the speakers that we bring in to, to learn that something completely new. Right. Now, Danielle, through your whole experience, you have uh, chips for charity, right? Yes. And, and so NextGen helped you with that? Yes. Uh, so Chips for Charity is one of our premier fundraising events. It's a flagship event for us. Um, it's a Monte Carlo style night. So with your ticket, you have table games, blackjack, uh, craps. There is open bar included, great food, a lot of fun. The buzz in the crowd is so amazing. It's so much fun. In fact, we've grown so big that we actually have a new location this year mm -hmm. um, at the DCCA on the riverfront, and we're so excited. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do is raise a lot of money that goes towards our grants that we choose to give community organizations. Um, and to me, being able to have fun while we do it, why yeah. not? 
Um, so it's been a great experience in, it's, it's, it's a great mix of doing something that's fulfilling that you care about, but also it's been wonderful professional development for me um, in terms of event planning, um, in terms of when we graduate out of next gen, having that experience behind me that I may not get in my job, um, and to, to really move forward and use that. So we're so excited about Chips for Charity. You're gonna have to come. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to, well, when is. is it? Let's come on. Let's tell everybody when it is. <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. Hey. It's uh, it's March seventh. It is at the DCCA. Like I said, um, tickets are available on www .nextgen rsvp.com um, and we have so many different options we have sponsorship levels we have VIP tickets I like to think that everybody that walks in the door is a VIP because it's yes, so much fun yes, yes. Uh, but it's it's just so great we would love to have you there so please come on by chips for charity I'm there yeah love March, chips. Yes. <laughs> March 7th but you know like Danny said that's the great thing we raise all this money through these events and through our donations. And then we get to give it away. And we're actually gonna be giving away over $25,000 wow. in just a couple weeks with money we raised from last year. Um, and we choose a focus every, roughly every two years so we can kind of stay up to date with the needs of the community. So right now, that focus is STEM education in Delaware. So 25,000 to great organizations that are improving STEM education in, uh, in Delaware. So that's exciting. Wow, that is really great. It's such a great organization, and I think it's an organization where you don't have to be afraid to say, hey, Dave, I need help with uh, learning how to, you know, be in development or... Trust me, I ask for help a lot. Right, and that's <laughs> so great. Do I. Well, but you know what, isn't that great that people can come there and feel like, you know what, because you know, people are afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we always get that, like, I don't want to ask, everybody's going to think I'm dumb or something like that. Right, but, you know, right. she, a prime example. You know, and, and you said it yourself, you ask a lot of questions too. All the too. time, all the time. And the great thing too is the group uh, comes with so many d different people come into the room mm -hmm. with a different skill set. Um, so folks that may be experts, they're an attorney. They might be helping us with our bylaws. Folks that are event planners and PR for a living, they'll assist with that sort of thing. Um, so we're all learning and teaching each other as we That's go great. along. And it, it's, it's a lot of fun. The group's really great. great. It's fascinating and an incredible group of people like Danielle um, that it's going to be really neat to see. This is our 10th our year and some of our alumni has gone on to do some great things. It's so much that we launched uh, our Founders Club, which is sort of like an alumni group. So it's going to be neat to see that continue to grow as our members go to serve on other boards and hopefully that will elevate, you know, all these nonprofit organizations in our community and, and make Delaware a better place. So. Yay, I love this. So let me ask you, if anybody's interested in learning about NextGen, maybe if they want to donate for chips, or chips for Charity or anything like that, what do they need to do? I think the easiest thing in this world we live in is to Google NextGen North. Three mm -hmm. words, NextGen North. From there, you can go to our website, you can donate, you can find that information about Chips for Charity, but you can also email us if you want to attend one of our meetings because we have typically at least a couple new faces at every meeting. And for somebody looking to get involved, um, that's usually the best way to start, to just show up. Um, we meet monthly in downtown Wilmington in the evening, and uh, we, you know, just come to our board meeting and we'll rope you in. Is there a criteria <laughs> to be a member, become a member of NextGen? No, no, just being, I think the only thing is being passionate about wanting to give back to the community and, um, and maybe learn a little bit more about nonprofit board leadership. Well, I'm certainly glad you brought Danielle with you. Me uh, too. Thank you. Yeah, tips I'm for glad charity. to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. And Chips for Charity, that's right up my alley, I'm telling you. We'll, we'll make sure you're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm good on the crap table. Ah. Right, we'll, we'll good on the crap table. We'll <laughs> but I'll make sure I'm on a different table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. And please come back again. And we love to hear from another up and coming leader too, like Danielle, you know, so Absolutely. come back. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. No problem. Thank you so much. When we return, do the right thing for Life Banquet after these messages. in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way 
to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Accidents happen. So do huge medical bills. Find out how to get health insurance coverage by visiting ChooseHealthDE.com. Okay, <laughs> let me get myself together. <laughs> We're all in laughter in here, so you know Frank must be here. Frank Hawkins, yes, yes. <laughs> AIDS Delaware is hosting the 14th annual Do the Right Thing for Life banquet, and Frank joins me now, and Paul Kennard just had a great one for you. But yes, he gonna, did. Yes, he did. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Man. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Frank. I'm glad you could be here. I'm glad I could be here, too. Thank you for having me <laughs> Okay. on the show. I'm right. Uh, all right, let's get it. Together. I don't know. Do you want to say anything great about our new set or anything? No, well, the new set is really, really nice. I, I'm feeling this new set. Right, right. It's not done. We're still under construction, okay, but, good. you know, we're getting there. Yeah, okay. You like it, right? I'm proud. Thank you. Brought the new year in with a new set. That makes it really new. <laughs> His three minutes is up. You know what? Let's go. <laughs> so, Frank, let's talk about the Do the Right Thing for Life banquet, yay, which is coming up 14th annual. Wow, I cannot believe you've been doing it for 14 years, and we have talked about every single one on this show. Uh, yes, we have, and I, I, I really, you know, seriously want to thank you oh, and WITN for having us um, each year. So that's 14 years that we've been coming on the show talking about the issue of HIV, talking about, you know, the impact that the banquet does have and, and why we host the banquet and how the banquet is a crucial event that we hold to not only provide something educational, but it's also something that's entertaining for the guests that come. But primarily, one of the things that we seek to do with the banquet is show the impact that barbershops and beauty salons have on HIV in the city of Wilmington mm -hmm. because that's what we do. We want to acknowledge them for allowing us to reach people that we wouldn't ordinarily reach through our traditional methods of outreach. And so we've grown. Um, we, we, we started out with a little seed and that seed has germinated that. and now it's this full-fledged event that people really want to attend and want to get tickets and be educated. And so um, HIV is not any, not something that has went away, and so we have to always talk about it in our in any way that we can to get people more and more educated. So this year's banquet, what can we expect? I know every year there's different. There's a, even though the message is the same, there's a, diff a different way of delivering the message each year, right? Yeah. What I guess what people can expect is um, I'm going to call it reinvigoration. Reinvigoration. Yeah, we are going to re-energize. Everything I'm going to say has the word re in front of it. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I think people have forgot what HIV is. I think some people have forgotten the impact that HIV can have. And the reason that I say that is because in our communities, I'm hearing more and more cases of people who are being infected by individuals who may know they have HIV, but don't Isn't that a crime? Not in our state, it's what? not a crime. And so it's more, you know, it's, it's happening more and more frequently. Um, people are calling me and telling me that, you know, their loved one got infected by someone who knows. And the thing about it is that 
there's nothing that we really can do as health professionals um, because of the confidentiality laws that, oh, that permeate right. our state. And so it's one of those things that we have to continue to get the message out to people that HIV is preventable. It's one of those issues that we have to let people know that you have to protect yourself, that sex is engaged in by two individuals, right. and that each individual that is part of this transaction is responsible for themselves. And so discussions actually should be had before the encounter happens, but a lot of times well, it does lie. not. Well, yeah. Uh, you know something, if you, <clears throat> you know, let's just use hypothetically, it's all hypothetically, you know, you're a single person, you're meeting someone and mm -hmm. you know, you're talking, you say, by the way, uh, I've gotten my HIV test, have you? What do you think they're gonna say? Well, if they say no. They're probably not, right? they're gonna say yes. Well, oh, let's, just, okay, okay, let's okay. just look okay. at the scenario. Okay. Should they say no, right? How do I know? You and don't. So, and, and that's why it's always about me protecting myself, right? So it's about me doing the, the next right thing to protect myself. So I need to assume that you do have HIV. And one of the things that I always tell people, assume that everyone that you come in contact with does have the virus because you don't know. And people may tell you some false information under the auspices of, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to, to conquer or do whatever it is that I need to do. And so I think, you know, it's about like protecting oneself ultimately because. Well, let me ask you, this is the 14th annual banquet. So what do you think has changed in the minds of folks um, since the first banquet regarding HIV and AIDS? Um, so I, that's a good question. I, and, Thank you. And, and let me just say that I believe that the people who are involved in the uh, planning, the barbershop owners and the beauty salon owners who are involved have committed themselves to the cause of fighting HIV and AIDS. I think they've become a lot more um, serious about it. Um, they tell more of their customers about HIV testing at AIDS Delaware and other places. Um, they talk about it a lot more because the barbershops and beauty salon owners live in the city and many of them hear about things. You know, they talk a lot in barbershops and beauty mm -hmm. bar salons. So they hear about things that are going on, people that have passed away um, as a result of living with HIV. So they get tell the messages and they talk about it and they, you know, tell other people you better get tested because you never know. And so that's, I think, what has happened since the beginning right. of this movement. And I'm calling it a movement because now we are in the phase of, again, getting people to join our movement and spread the word a lot more, you know, rigorously like, listen, we don't know who is infected. And if you don't know who's infected, then you need to take the necessary steps to protect yourself and others. Well, let me ask you, um, couples in a relationship, when's a good time for them to get, let's say a new relationship, when's a good time for them both to get tested? Because now let's look at this. Um, you can get tested if I, if I get tested today, well, there's like a time frame, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what is it, six months? So there's a window period of three to six months. Right. So what we encourage people... Well, let's is, explain window period in case anybody doesn't okay, know what so we're talking about. The window period do. is the period that if you've been exposed to HIV, it takes your body time to develop the antibodies that the test looks for. Right. So if, you, you know, if you've been exposed to HIV and your body has not developed the antibodies, then you will not test positive, positive right. for the HIV antibody test because there are none present. So what we encourage people to do is to wait, at least if they think they've been exposed, they should wait at least three to six months after their first test? After the well, initial like could, exposure. After the initial exposure. If they think they've been exposed. So if, for example, let's, so if you go out and have unsafe sex today mm -hmm. and you think you've been exposed, you would need to wait at least 90 days. 
before, before you, you get, do your test. Before you do your right, test. Right, okay. And that's what the CDC recommends. So they okay. recommend 90 days for to be sure that the antibodies have developed. Okay. All right? So now after that 90 day period, you come and you get tested, you will know about that event that happened on January the 14th. But in between January 14th and that 90 day period, you either have to practice some form of safer sex or abstinence or have no sex exactly should they share results some 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 couples do that i think that's a personal decision i think if you are seeking to be in a monogamous committed relationship then i think it should be something that you and your partner would want to share with one another so that you can each know each other's status and this way the relationship is built on some type of trust and integrity and then you can move forward and proceed forward after after you know in the proper way because what if you're trying to you know in a heterosexual relationship you're trying to have a child let's say mm -hmm. then this way we know each other's status and we can move forward in a manner to protect the unborn um, fetus Right. That, we're, that we're doing so you know it's a lot it's a lot going on and you know the banquet is just one of those and so waterfall has um been renovated it is fabulous and you know we just want people to come out and have a good time uh, you know is there any uh, entertainment there well we have we have a karaoke we, i mean no, you know no, i do like to sing this is not it's not a karaoke show uh, no um, i'm just i'm just asking for entertainment. we don't do any karaoke. well we do have entertainment we have a dj Okay. Um, we have a young lady who's going to play the flute. Um, um, at during Anybody singing any cool 70s or 80s music? No. Really? Unfortunately, no. We don't have any. I do do that. I make appearances, you know. Well, listen, you come on down to the 14th annual banquet <laughs> that's going to be held <laughs> on February the 7th <laughs> at Waterfall Banquet Conference Center. Doors open at 6 p.m. Um, the cocktail hours from 6 to 7, and then we start the actual event. And um, tickets are $25, so we want people to come out, have a really great time. I'll tell you, you know, as the um, coordinator for the event, uh, it's, it makes me proud to see how the event has evolved. Our first event was at the American Legion, which was a wow. A hall. I you're right. I <laughs> right. And you're here at the and waterfall. now we're at the waterfall, yeah. and we've been at Waterfall Banquet Conference Center, and I'll tell you, and the, the new owners of Waterfall, um, when I went to meet with them, they was like, sure, we'll have you know, we'll have you back. We're on, we're undergoing renovations, but we, we we saw your event last year, and we like sure you could come back with the event. They because they care right about the issue of HIV. Hey, who's the keynote speaker? Our keynote speaker this year is a, a gentleman who I've known for many years. Uh, he even like has played an important part in my development professionally and he's with the Division of Public Health and his name is Greg Williams. And Greg is going to, um, he told me like he's excited, he's preparing and he's going to deliver a dynamic message, you know, at our upcoming bank. And the message is, um, about related the impact of HIV in the African American community. Do you actually have any? You, well, you have in the past had people who actually are infected with HIV mm -hmm. speak to mm -hmm. the attendees at the banquet, right? Yes, we have, over the years we've had a few individuals. Actually, last year our speaker was HIV positive um, and disclosed her status to individuals and let individuals know that living with HIV, you know. Um, how long she's been living with it, and the impact when she found out and encouraged others. If you don't know your status, you're doing yourself a disservice. Mm -hmm. And the reason that she said that is because when people don't know their status, the virus can be replicating and multiplying in a manner that you don't know, but because you feel healthy, you don't know what's going on on the inside. You didn't ask me what kind of entertainment do I do. Well, that's not the discussion right now. We, I mean, I just want to go back to this right, part. You want to know? What kind of entertainment? I sing. Oh. Well, maybe. You know what? Now, wait a minute. You want to know what I say? This <laughs> is our fucking <laughs> I don't know what part. I don't know what part of the show this is, <laughs> gentlemen. But I hey. mean, it's, it's the entertainment portion oh, of it. Okay, all right. I'm Listen. just saying, yeah. All right. 
I'll be around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess you didn't like that, huh? No. That's my rendition of the spinners. I'll be around. That's a good way to have safe sex. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, this show, this show never did. did, did listen. So we want every. Let me take over here. Okay. This Go is, ahead. Take so over. we want everyone to come out on February the seventh uh, to the Waterfall Banquet Conference Center. Uh, the uh, time is 6 p.m. for the 14th annual Do the Right Thing for Life Banquet. I promise you that once you come to the event, you probably will not want to miss another one. It's going to be, edu it's going to be educational as well as entertaining. Um, it's going to be just a really great time. And again, our message is, you know, please get tested, know your status. That's that, I think that's the most powerful message that I always give on the show. It is. That people should it know is. that, I mean, people should know that's that. You know, and, and you know what we find out too, Shannon, is that people go off of other people's status. What so, do you mean? So, so if you say to someone, have you been tested? They'll be, they'll, they may say, oh no, my girlfriend got tested. That, her has test. Has nothing to do with you. That's, and that's what we say. Her test result has nothing to do with your test result. My, oh, my partner got tested last week they're negative. Well, that has nothing to do right. with your, 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 your health status. And so that's why we encourage people to know your own status. And once you get tested, I always tell people to make it part of your medical record. So take your test results to your doctor. Say, doctor, listen, I got tested. I want you to put this in my file. Because mm -hmm. there are some people, unfortunately, who do engage in unsafe behaviors. And that's not just of a sexual nature. We're also talking, you heard uh, Dr. Rate and Domenico yeah. on here. We're talking about people that are injecting drugs. Yeah. Okay, so then we're talking about the issue of tattooing. Oh, really? So, so we have, yeah. I see, was worse, and, uh, hepatitis was worse than that. Hepatitis, that. HIV as well. So when the Division of Public Health, when they go out to a tattoo salon and it's not operating with proper protocol and procedures, many times you'll see in the news journal that they say, they close the place and encourage people to go get tested for HIV and hepatitis C. That's pretty scary. Right? Because if they're using unsafe needles and not sterilization, mm -hmm. the process is not correct, then people are at risk. And now, so that's, uh, the other thing is that tattoo parties. Tattoo parties are popping up all, they're, they're, they're like an underground mm -hmm. thing that's going on. And we find that a lot of teenagers attend these tattoo parties. So the premise is, if a teenager goes to a tattoo party and they were to get infected with hepatitis C or HIV, the likelihood of them finding out sooner is nil because they feel okay, so they won't think they've been exposed to anything, and we probably won't find out if they've been exposed until they're in their 20s. Right, right, And so that's right. why one of the things that we're also doing is uh, putting, highlighting this tattoo party issue because they're frequent. Young people are, ha are, are having them and they're attending them because a lot of young people do want a tattoo. Right. And many times they can't afford to go to a legitimate tattoo place so they go to a tat party where they can get a tattoo for $25, for $40, whatever the case may be. And sometimes a person might not have clean needles there. And, and that's scary. Let me, while we're talking about teens, when does um, Delaware Teen Idol start up again? Well, our, our first Delaware Teen Idol meeting will happen next month. Okay. And we will begin all of the, the logistics for it, the planning. I probably have to wait to talk with representatives of the Grand because the DuPont Theater yeah, is being yeah, sold yeah. to the Grand. So I don't know how that's going to play out. So I'm kind of, I probably have to wait a little while to figure out what's going on with that. But, but what it, are we looking for this year? Can we talk about what are we looking for in contestants this year? Um, we still want we still want young people that are rapping, that can sing, that can do poetry, and they have to address an issue. You know, HIV being one of them, mental health, substance abuse, violence prevention, teen pregnancy prevention, fatherhood involvement, domestic violence as well is a, is a new one that we're going to incorporate. And so, and we have some some new. Um, scoring methods that we want to use okay. as well. So the scoring method will begin 
not at the finals, but it's going to begin from the moment you are inducted into the finals itself. So after, okay. you, after your audition, after you audition, we score you on your audition, and that carries you know, into the finals. If you make a meeting, that's part of it, your presentation, why you want to be in Teen Idol. So we have a little something new that's going okay. on um, to make it a little bit more interesting and fun and to keep the young people committed and, and, and wanting to be a part of Delaware Teen Idol. And people are already calling. I'm I know gonna, they are. Yeah, they want to know, know when are. are the auditions happening, but we haven't, we, we haven't met yet. So once we meet um, and start figuring out when everything is going to take place, um, then we'll start okay. putting the information out in the community, send it out to the high schools, all of the community centers, youth and, organizations. Now then, before you. we go, um, age testing at um, AIDS, AIDS Delaware, mm -hmm. anonymous, free? It's free and, and it's confidential. Okay. So confidential means you have you do the state requirement. I said anonymous. Yeah, right. Yeah, state requirement is that you have to present some type of identification, um, and then we proceed with the testing method. Can we? Um, can people come every day? What are yeah. the hours? Well, we we, we operate from eight thirty to four thirty. So you can come Monday through Friday, eight thirty to four thirty. We also have um, satellite locations where we do testings throughout the week. Some in Newark. Uh, I think some in Claymont, what have you. Okay. But they can call us at AIDS Delaware if they want more information on where we're doing testing. Um, but I suggest that you come into the office most of the time. Okay, and you have counseling on site, mm -hmm. whether your result is positive or negative. Or negative. And that, that, we only have that, a minute left, Frank. Okay, that, but that's away. a good point because when, when you meet with us, even if your result is negative, based on your reason for coming in, we still provide you counseling because we want to keep people who are negative, negative. So how can we keep you negative? So if you have a problem using condoms, what do we need to do to help you practice using condoms more? And that may require a person who's negative to come back in again for another counseling session. Oh. It's free. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. So. Well, yep. that's good. Well, I'm glad you could be here, Frank. I'm glad I could be here, too, for more than three minutes. And I'm glad. <laughs> Not Paul. He's like, <laughs> and I know you're glad you went last. <laughs> let's not talk about that. Yes. Well, let's talk about me singing. At the, I love music. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Thank you, Frank. Thank, Thank you, for you having crew. Me. And we hope you love our new set yeah, and like stay tuned. Set. And, uh, you know, and thanks everybody for watching Window of Wilmington. For everybody here at WITN Channel 22, I'm Shannon Harris. We'll see you next time.